Hello again everybody, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be reading uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're starting with verse 1. Just a short chapter. Paul was writing, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or recommend ourselves, or approve of ourselves, or do we need, as some others, letters of commendation or recommendation to you, or letters of commendation or recommendation from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. For you are prominently declared to be the letter of Christ, prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on human tablets of the heart. So Paul here is talking about being recommended. Does he come to the church and say, um, we approve of ourselves, we recommend ourselves, do, do we need letters of recommendation from others? And so it's a bit like, uh, I suppose if you're going for a job interview and they say, what did your former, former employees um, say about you? What's your work record? And then you have to bring a letter of recommendation. Or if you, or in, 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 in various different situations, a person might say, I'll consider you for the job, for the position, um, uh, a, a, a play, a, a, you know, something to do with responsibility. And you need a letter of recommendation. And Paul is saying here, do we need, as some others, letters of recommendation to you or letters of recommendation from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. So he was saying, people should be able to read you. He's saying to the Corinthians, we don't need to write a letter. We don't need to write a letter of recommendation of you. You should be read and known by all men. Okay? Not, in it, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on human tablets of the heart. We are living letters. And so wherever we go... Um, we hear people say, oh, I can read people really well, yeah? Now, it shouldn't be that hard for people to read us. A person should be, shouldn't probably spend much more than five minutes in our presence without realising that we're good, decent people, okay? That is, oh, I like being around this person. They're friendly, they're, they're kind, they're good, and um, I've got a good impression already, okay? So by us being Christians and us learning from the Bible, letting the Holy Spirit do his work in our hearts, in our souls, in our mind, body, and so forth. We become that living letter. And so when people see us, they read us, and what they should be reading is Christian character, faith, hope, and love, and so forth. Verse 4. We have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to take credit of anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So, Paul is saying that I'm not bragging about myself. I'm not here bragging, saying, oh yeah, I'm taking credit for what I've done. I'm a good person because of me. I've achieved this because of me. You know, he's saying our sufficiency is of God. Is from God. God has made us able ministers of the New Testament. He's made us able to share the gospel. He's made us able to walk with him. Okay? We can't do these things in our own strength. We ask God for help, then we carry out the action. Okay? So there is a balance. We need to sort of say, Lord, I need your help today. And then we do our part and act on the Bible acts on the words of of God and carry it out but we ask for God to help and we recognize at the end of the day Lord whatever I've done today you may be able to do it now I have heard some people you know take it to extremes like oh I need to ask God to help me be able to drive a car you know I need God to help me mow the lawn and stuff like that or you know I need him to help me with my shopping <clears throat> and there is an excessiveness there you know what I mean um you are quite able to drive a car if you've passed your test yeah you've proven that there are some things that we're able to do like mowing the lawn but obviously we can still pray for god's grace when i go for a drive that god's protection will be with me yeah god give me wisdom and sensitivity to know when to put them brakes on to notice when the car is coming towards me and there could be a possible crash 
Now I believe in that, yeah. But in the in the generic sense of driving a car, mowing the lawn, you know, you could even say, Lord, as I go out, you know, just protect me in general. I don't think we should be asking God to, to uh, you know, which butter to buy from Sainsbury's and, you know, or or how if, to use your faith to mow the lawn. I'm, I'm bit, being excessive here, but just to make a point. But God has made us able to do his work and do his work. And that's what Paul wants us to get across. Not to take the credit for ourselves, but give credit where it is due. For if the ministry that brought death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses, because of the glory of his countenance, the glory which was to fade away, how would the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation is glorious, the ministry of righteousness much more exceeds it in glory. Even that which was made glorious had no glory in comparison to the glory in excels. <laughs> For if that which fades was glorious, that which remains is much more glorious. <laughs> I mean, it just tickles me. Paul just tickles me with the things that he writes. I mean, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? The casual reader of this will just go off into outer space. They might know what he's talking about. You need an understanding of what he's talking about, and it's based in the Old Testament. When Moses got the Ten Commandments, yeah, these are what was written and engraved on stone. He, when God wrote on that stone, the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments on that stone. It wasn't Moses, he didn't have a hammer and chisel, okay, or a biro or something. God's finger, literally his finger, burnt them Ten Commandments into that stone. Tss, 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 like that. And from that and that amazing power that comes from God, it reflected onto Moses' face. And Moses' skin in his face absorbed that power so that as he come away from it, this blinding beam of light just poof, shone off his face. And wherever he'd look, this massive beam of light just a charm, just fly off his face and no one could look at it that's why it says um for the ministry that brought death which is the law moses written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of israel could not look intently at the face of moses because of the glory of his countenance the glory which was to fade away how would the ministry of the spirit not be much more glorious and so it's reflect reflecting back to referring sorry back to when moses's face becomes so so full of God's power and light that he had to put a veil over his face now when he had that veil over his face face covering people could look at him and talk to him but if he was to take that off they'd... I don't know what was happening to him to be honest but they'd at least get blinded you know it was just so that, that would have been amazing to see just amazing to see um, I, I, heard, I heard one minister say that he went to heaven and that when he came back, the, the glory of God was shining from his face and people in the church were saying to him, oh, well, I can see the glory coming from your face. And I thought, of course you did, bruv. Of course you did. <clears throat> this is, you know, an amazing, amazing event. So that's what that's talking about, referring to the glory came from Moses' face. Seeing then that we have such hope, we speak with great boldness. When you've got hope, when you've got, that assurance that things are going to work out, Romans 8, 28, you can have boldness. So if you're facing a situation or circumstance and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. If you haven't got hope, you're going to have no confidence, are you? But with hope comes confidence, comes boldness. It gives you courage and makes you think, I've got a guarantee this is going to work because God has given me hope. He's like whispering to me. He's letting me know in my, in my heart, in my spirit and my mind, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. And then they make you brave. Seeing then we have such hope, we speak with great boldness, not as Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Instead, their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the, reading of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, the veil which was been done away with in Christ. Now, Paul's referring to the Old Testament, yeah? When the children of Israel read the Old Testament, they didn't read it like we do now. They didn't know, they didn't have the Messiah, 
The Messiah had not come. He had not fulfilled over 300 prophecies and every prophecy in the Old Testament. They didn't even have a clue who the Messiah was going to be. They just had these little images here and there, little bits of the puzzle. And so, therefore, it was like getting a book out. Let's say get the Old Testament out, yeah? And then you got a sheet of paper and you cut little like square holes out of it lines and then you lay it over the top of the book and so you've only got scattered across the book maybe 10 verses and you're like oh hang on a minute it says something about the lamb of god okay down here his feet and his feet and his hands shall be pierced but i can't see the rest of the page because covering the page of this old testament is this piece of paper and it's only got selected verses cut out uh it's only got selected verses shown that you can see through the bit of paper that's been cut into lines so it's veiled do you get what i mean and so that's what it's, that's what paul's speaking about here that their minds were blinded for until this day the same veil remains unlifted when they read the old testament the veil which was done away in christ when jesus came along died on the cross rose from the dead done all that he'd done done his earthly ministry it's like he took that bit of paper threw it away and all of a sudden oh wow i can read the whole old testament now i can understand it and and when they're reading it they're seeing hands and feet were pierced jesus that's jesus um he this he does this he does that the messiah will this that and the other yeah done that done that's everything jesus done but until jesus come along they didn't know who he who he was going to be and their mind was blinded they could only see in part. Um, then it says, But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is in their hearts. Nevertheless, when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. <clears throat> and so when the Jews read the Old Testament, even though they've literally got every page, they can see every page without a bit of paper on it, spiritually speaking, that bit of paper is still covering it up. Because they're not, understanding that the old testament prophecies are speaking of jesus christ they're still rejecting christ still not believing it that jesus was the messiah is the messiah so therefore they will continue to read the old testament with a veil over their eyes and the veil over the old testament as it was uh, nevertheless when anyone turns to the lord the veil is removed and so when a person gets born again john 3 verse 3 says except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god now the word see there sometimes we read it as like oh well they won't see heaven but the word see there means to to understand to perceive to see to understand and so therefore and, and then further on in john 3 i think it might be verse 6 except a man be born again he cannot enter the kingdom of god so it says he cannot see the kingdom of god and then again it says he cannot enter the kingdom of god so first of all you've got to see the kingdom of god in order to enter the kingdom of god and when you're born again the veil is removed from your eyes that that has blinded you from the word of god and from the truth of the gospel that's removed now you can see the kingdom of god and because you can see it now you can enter it as well as you're spiritually reborn now the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty or freedom but we all, seeing the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces, as in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. We are changed, transformed from glory to glory. The more we give, the more time we give to God, I'm not talking about uh, necessarily hours, minutes and stuff, I'm talking about quality investment in our time. You can go to work work 12 hours a day sleep eat and all the rest of the thing i haven't really given much time to god i only managed a half hour prayer today and, and 15 you know 15 minute bible reading 15 minute prayer so i've only given god half an hour today i've been busy now that that isn't that isn't like giving god quality time isn't about specific amount of time but you are giving god your full day when you're at work because if you're walking in the spirit and you're not walking in the flesh and you're walking in love and you're you're ready and available to pray uh, whether it's publicly or quietly under your breath 
when God says pray for that person. You know, you can be on the job and God can say pray for that person. It might be laying hands on them or it might be just go off in the bathroom, pray for them. Um, or just say a few words. When you finish the end of the day, God doesn't look at it like, well, I believe, I don't think he does anyway. Look at it as like, oh, well, Jason only spent 15 minutes praying, 15 minutes reading the Bible today. So what did he do the other 23 and a half hours? He didn't, that wasn't my time with him. It was because I was being ready and available to be used by him at the, you know, click of a finger. Yes, I will pray for that person, Lord. I will share your word with somebody. I will walk in love towards that person and help and and live the practical christian life so don't feel condemned yeah, if you feel that you're not spending enough time with god in hours and minutes okay don't don't be lazy you obviously read your bible and pray definitely do that but don't get hung up on how many minutes hours you're doing but rather look at it as lifestyle christianity where every minute of the day you've got your intent around me saying god you tell me to do it i'll do it Okay, well, I hope you got um, a lot out of today. I certainly did. Love reading the Bible. It's fed me today, so I'm feeling good. And I hope it's fed you as well. Well, God bless you. I'll see you in the next video. Please leave a comment, a like, subscribe to my channel for more upcoming videos. God bless you all in Jesus' mighty name. Bye-bye.